All right, awesome. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, our Sunday night uh, sutra study group. Um, oh, great, everybody's here. Yay, welcome, everybody, welcome. Um, so this is part two of a sutra. <laughs> well, you know, what is the sutra called? Well, it's a sutra that's called the Vidya Prabta Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Bodhisattva, lightning obtainer, the questions of Bodhisattva Vidya Prabta. Uh, but it's also called this inexhaustible stores of wisdom or the inexhaustible hidden treasuries. And of course, <laughs> this is Sutra 20 of the Ratnakuta Sutra collection of 49 sutras. But just to confuse you even more, it's sutra number nine in the Chang translation. <laughs> and we're off on part two. Last time I introduced us to our hero, Vidya Prapta, lightning obtainer Bodhisattva, who, who has some questions for the Buddha who was on the Mount, uh, the Vulture's Peak, Mount uh, Gridrakuta in Rajgriha. I'm going to try to just not summarize, actually say, uh, please see uh, part one <laughs> for the introduction, for the preliminary, and for a great little Dharma talk on the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of reality, which we're gonna review tonight, but you know, I'm not gonna do the whole thing again. So see part one. I'm gonna quickly, just to bring us back up to speed, this is a very simple sutra to introduce that way. Bodhisattva, lightning obtainer, Vijaprapta, asked the Buddha, what are, what are the practices of the Bodhisattva? What, are, what is the bodhisattva practice? What is the way to bodhisattvahood? Um, that's the question. What is the bodhisattva path? Simple. Great. Um, really quickly, because I know a lot of people, you know, have the sutra in front of them. I just want to remind us of two ideas going into this uh, tonight, going into tonight. One of them is sort of the cipher, what I would call the cipher, which is the idea of the hidden treasuries. This idea of these treasuries, right? I've drawn this, you know, mural, these cartoons of these like, you know, treasure chests full of jewels, right? And Bodhisattva Vidyaprapta asked his questions to the Buddha, and then he asked them again in verse and when he was sort of extolling the buddha he said to the buddha that you that you buddha reveal the correct path the right path so that all may attain ultimate peace and joy the supreme merits you have accumulated are like a treasure trove so in the poem, as usual, this is how these things, you know, it's a, it's a format at this point, but therein lies our little hidden thing about this idea of a treasure trove of merit accumulated from practice. So there's some ideas there. So I just wanted to draw our attention to that idea that we're playing with the metaphor of this treasure trove, you know, hidden treasure pirate stuff, right? And, and connected to that, and, and I think this is a cool way to just ease us into tonight. Um, after the Bodhisattva Vijaprapta is done with his poem, he says this thing about, or actually, pardon me, this is the Buddha's reply. And this is, this is a great place to pick up um, because we didn't actually even really get into the sutra last time. On page 151 of the Chang translation, the Buddha told Vijaprapta, Bodhisattva Vijaprapta, Bodhisattva, lightning attainment. Bodhisattvas, great beings, Mahasattvas, 
have five hidden treasuries. Great hidden treasuries and exhaustible hidden treasuries, universally exhaustible hidden treasuries. And once bodhisattvas possess possess these hidden treasures, possess these stores, they will be relieved from poverty forever. You know, achieve all superior virtues, quickly attain supreme enlightenment, sure, sure, sure. But I want to pause on that one sentence or that one part of the sentence that, that bodhisattvas who figure this out <laughs> that figure these five, where these hidden treasures are. They, they, they've got the roadmap, X marks the spot. They have found all five hidden treasures that they will be relieved from poverty forever. The reason why I'm pausing on this is that when I, when I first read the sutra a long time ago, and even when I picked it back up to get ready for this, even I was like, poverty? Really? Are we really concerned about poverty? Are we really concerned about um, not being poor in that way? Like, what's the language here? What's going on? And I, of course, did my language research. And it's like, no, sure enough, they're talking poverty. But are they? If they're talking about these hidden treasures of accumulated merits of practice, maybe poverty doesn't mean what we think it means. But again, that's just a review of these ideas that Vijaprapta wants to know how do bodhisattvas do the bodhisattva thing? What's the bodhisattva practice? And the Buddha replies that they are, are these five hidden treasuries. And tonight, to begin... We're going to open up the first treasury. We're going to open up this first treasury of five. The Buddha lists these five hidden treasuries, the one of raga, um, attraction, desire. I'm going to talk about that at length tonight. Dvesha, aversion or anger. Moha, delusion. An equal, an equal mix of, de of, of desire, anger, and delusion, or attraction, aversion, and confusion. That's another way of translating these, by the way. Attraction, aversion, and confusion. So an equal mix of those. And then the fifth one. We're not going to get anywhere near the fifth one tonight. But the fifth one, all dharmas, all, all everything, sarva dharma, right? So... You just, you forget about these for tonight. I don't think we'll even get through all these, all through all three of these. But tonight we are going to begin with some talk about all three of these, because these are always sort of, well, discussed in the same breath, in that sense of that these are what are called the three kleshas, afflictions, the three afflictions, the three defilements, the three poisons. So if you know this language in Buddhism of the three poisons, the three afflictions, the three defilements, it's all the same idea, which are these three. And well, so tonight I, I've drawn our, our karma ball, right? This ball of attraction, aversion, confusion, or desire, anger, delusion, greed, Hatred, ignorance is another usual way, right? So here they are, the, 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 gr the green of desire, of jealousy, right? The green of desire, the red heat of anger, and the, this dark blue of confusion. I don't know, I'm doing the best I can with the colors here, right? But indeed, the word klesha means coloring. And so I'm, I'm trying to be a little poetic here with this idea of these colorings of the mind, seeing the world through our greed, anger, and delusion. But again, I want to make clear these words, raga, dvesha, and moha. If you've ever seen the wheel of life, the bhava chakra mandala, Mara is biting this wheel of samsara, this wheel of life. But at the heart, the core problem 
the the wheel of samsara spins upon the confluence of these three these three um these three uh dharmas right these three these three phenomena here we go so really quickly just to let you know Yes, tonight we're going to be talking about sexuality. We're going to be talking about desire for sensual, sexual pleasure. And it's the, the sutra talks about sexuality. So I'm going to talk about sexuality. That's, that is the, for Buddhists, the, the pinnacle of desire, the pinnacle of, of this attraction. So the sutra is going to talk about sexuality. I'll talk about sexuality. But I want to back way, 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 way up before we even get to kama, sensual pleasure, sensual desire, and all of that. These three defilements, poisons, afflictions, raga, devesha, and moha, for right now, I prefer attraction, aversion, and confusion. Those are a little bit closer to what the words Raga Devesha and Moha mean. And, and I guess what I want to get at really quickly without spending too much time on like the three poisons, because we're actually going to go like, I don't even know where we're going. I don't even know where we're going, but this original idea that what, that what this is, the experience of self, what the experience of self is, what a sentient being is, what the problem is actually, is that, there, that what this is, is this karma ball, this ball of attraction, aversion, and confusion. And there, put, to put it very simply, almost actually pantom, pantomimically, I'm going to pantomime the three poisons, right? The first one, attraction, desire, right? It's about like, hmm, like, hmm, mm, mm, it's a smile and it's like, mm, it feels so good. It's like, it's, it's a, it's a smile. It's that, right? What is, what is Devesha? What is aversion? So we've got like, like, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, and then of course, if, if it isn't clear already, it's like, oh, uh, like what's going on here? This is the moha. Moha means confusion. It's like confusion. It's like waking from a dream, you know, and you're like kind of foggy and it's like, whoa, what, what is this? Wait, what is that? Oh, gimme, gimme. Ah! Oh, wait, what, what's going on? Oh, gimme, gimme. Ah! Oh, and it's just this ball of like, you know, attraction, aversion. Wait, what's going on? Attraction, aversion. What's going on? And it just like keeps snowballing into you, into me, into phenomena, and in, in all this. That's the idea of the karma ball. Uh, the little smiley face, the little sad face, and the confused face. It's like, mm, huh? Mm, mm, huh? Just looping around, right? And for old school Shravaka style, Theravada style, old school Buddhism, the, car the karma ball was the problem. The wanting, the pushing away, and the confusion about what's going on here to begin with, that was the problem. Those are the problem. And so we, we work on them. And there's a variety of techniques to work on them. And it's not what we're here to talk about tonight. This is sort of a new twist on the classic, right? And I just needed to let you know that it, because if you weren't aware already, 
this is like the fundamental teaching of Buddhism. <laughs> this attraction, aversion, confusion idea, right? Um, the three poisons. Again, it's the very hub that the wheel turns around, or the axle, I should say, around which the, the, the wheel turns. And dealing with them, and insofar as they are poisons, extracting the poisons, right? That's the project. Well, you need to keep that in mind. You need to know about the karma ball. You need to know all of that to get to the, the really interesting uh, answer that the Buddha gives, Vijaprapta. <laughs> and I want to, before, I, there's just one more thing I have to tell you about. <laughs> before we dive into this. And I, and I apologize for the multiple digressions here, but the Bodhisattva Vijaprapta asks the Buddha about the practice of the Bodhisattva, the practices of the Bodhisattva. And while it's very, very easy actually for that, that idea to the practice, it's very easy for that idea to just go right by us. That the, oh yeah, what, do, what, how do you become a, no, 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 no. I say this because I mentioned this last week that this sutra is in, in, in dialogue with, or is very aware of these 10 bodhisattva stages, these 10, Bumis, the ten, uh, the ten progresses of the Bodhisattva, and it is actually a particular stage. Uh, it's not actually a stage. I want to choose my words carefully. It's an abode, but it's a particular moment in the progression of the Bodhisattva, which is the stage or the abode of practice. <laughs> And when the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara was practicing the profound Pranyaparamita and realized that the five skandhas are empty and thus overcame came all suffering, Shariputra, that first line of the Heart Sutra is about this stage or abode of practice. And I'm saying all of this because the Bodhisattva path is a is a serious one and it this isn't the first stage of it <laughs> the first stage of it is actually the initial determination for enlightenment or the development of bodhicitta and so i'm saying all of that because well bodhisattva i mean folks the bodhisattva is lightning obtainer you, you don't get a name like, like lightning obtainment without having already gotten pretty far is what I mean. It's not a uh, Bodhisattva will obtain uh, lightning in some future time. It's like has all it is Bodhisattva lightning attainer. And so what I'm getting at is that this is an advanced Bodhisattva in the stage of practice, asking the Buddha about the stage of practice. And what's great about a non-esoteric, non-Vajrayana, good old Mahayana Sutra, what's good about a good old-fashioned Mahayana Sutra is that even though this is an advanced bodhisattva asking about advanced bodhisattva practices, there is still a message for you and me, is what I'm saying. So I, I, I want, I, I need to make this distinction because, well, you'll, you'll see, you'll, you'll, it'll all make sense in a second. It really, really will. But that was a long disclaimer about this idea. And before I forget, one more digression and then we're, and then we're off. The, the translation here, uh, the translation, they, I know why they did what they did. I know why. Translation is a very tricky game, especially when you know you will not be present 
when the person is reading it. And that's a big responsibility to know that, you know, what you're putting down, you won't be there to defend. And so you need to, you need to be careful about that. And what I mean by that is, for example, this sutra is called here, the inexhaustible treasuries or stores of wisdom. Not hidden, they, 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 they ducked that. And so they're making these, like, they're like, this, these are wisdom practices. Remember, these are wisdom. But why I'm saying this is that the, the actual, the, the Buddha says, at least in the Chinese translation, he says, what are, he's, this is the end. Uh, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas have five hidden practices. And the, the word here, the Chinese word here, is this word xing, which means to practice, like the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, practicing pranyaparamita. This word pra it means practice. And what the Chinese says is that what are these five hidden treasuries? They are the hidden treasury of the practice of desire the hidden treasury of the practice of anger, the hidden treasury of the practice of delusion, and then, of course, the hidden treasury of the practice of all three kleshas and the hidden practice of all dharmas. But what I'm getting at is that the Chinese is very clear. This is like a, like a wait, what did the Buddha say? That these are the bodhisattvas the practice of anger? I thought I wasn't supposed to go anywhere near anger. And, and herein begins the subtle kind of non-dual shift. I'm not going to say tantric or vajrayana or any of that because we're not going like all the way quite to the other side, if you know what I mean. But we are going to be in that dharmadhatu which I spent all last time on for a reason, because we're going to be in this kind of realm of equality. Okay, so you need to know that these are practices of these afflictions. And now we are about to open up the first treasury, unless there's any questions, comments, ideas, or epiphanies. Sweet. All right. Bodhisattva, lightning attainment. Bodhisattva, Vijaprapta. What is a Bodhisattva Mahasattva's hidden treasury of the practice of desire? The hidden treasury of the practice of Raga? When sentient beings act out of desire, they are bound by wrong views. They make distinctions among phenomena. They cling to and indulge in visual forms, auditory sounds, scents, tastes, textures, and dharmas, ideas. Bodhisattvas should have true knowledge of mentalities. What sentient beings delight in and wish for, what circumstances aggravate their habitual defilements, what faith and understanding they have achieved, what kinds of good roots they have previously planted, what vehicles teachings will arouse their aspiration for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment and how long it will take for their good roots to come to maturation. Bodhisattvas should examine all these carefully and provide the proper remedy needed to cut off those sentient beings' passions completely and cause them to develop wholesome minds continuously. So I'm going to pause. <clears throat> so this is part of the reason why I 
started with this idea that lightning obtainer bodhisattva is apparently an advanced bodhisattva act asking about advanced bodhisattva practices in particular the these pra, now we're going to learn about the practice of of raga and the reason why it's, i mention that is this idea that well i i i i i mentioned at the beginning of last class the first class you if you didn't know any better you would think bodhisattvas have a savior complex you would think this idea that like must save all sentient beings must save all sentient beings and like that they have like delusions of grandeur and ideas that they can save all sentient beings and I tried last time quickly to sort of dissuade you of thinking of it that way. And I want to try to do that again, because I don't think the sutra is going to really make its point. If you, if you aren't sensitive to what is being discussed, this Bodhisattva path, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody earlier and we were talking about this like uh, um, Theravada Mahayana distinction, old school, new school Buddhism. And I thought of, or we thought of together, an interesting comparison, which is the idea of sobriety, of, of recovery and becoming sober. And the idea that the Buddhism, the original Theravada project is how to be, get sober. I, like a deep, you know, a deep sense of sober in a sense of like, like clear seeing sober, right? But it's, it's sort of an idea of addiction to life, addiction to desires, addiction in that sense. And so sobriety and methods for sobriety. Awesome. Yes. Let us all get sober. Yes. The Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva path, of course, of course, it's about sobriety, but the Bodhisattva path is, is, a, is the one who becomes like a counselor because they've been through it. They've been through it. They've, they've gone through it. They've been there. They can speak from experience, but they've also achieved the goal in a sense that they've be, they've, they're sober, you know, years sober now. And like they get it and they've conquered it and whatever language they want to use to describe their experience in that way. But the idea is, is like, to then go back, to go back into the bars, to go back into the world of alcoholism, to go back into that world, but armed, you know, and ready, and then with compassion to share what you've learned and to help other people get sober, recover. That's not delusions of grandeur. That is not a savior complex. That's, I don't you know, it's called what, morality. Uh, you know, it's, I don't, you know, I, my point tonight is, is I do want to take this idea out of delusions of, of Messiah complex, delusions of grandeur, and bring it down to that what we're reading tonight is about the Bodhisattva going into the world, a world full of desireful, angry, delusional people but not for, not for a moment forgetting their own, in a sense, delusions, anger, and desires. Okay, so I just want to make that clear that we're talking about like a counselor in that sense. And so the Bodhisattva says to the Bodhisattva lightning attainer, counselor, counselor Bodhisattva, that you should know, right? That, that, that sentient beings, they act out of desire. We act out of desire, out of raga, attraction. And we're bound by wrong views, making distinctions among phenomena. R right, right there, actually, that line, <laughs> acting out of desire, bound by wrong views, making distinctions among all phenomena that's called uh not that's called not the dharma datu <laughs> remember the dharma datu is this kind of like wild um realm of 
interdependently created reality distinguishing among phenomena and being like oh that's pretty that's ugly i want that i don't distinguishing among phenomena yeah the buddha said that's the problem sentient beings act out of desire bound by wrong views making distinctions among phenomena they cling to and indulge in visual stuff <laughs> seeing stuff hearing stuff smelling stuff tasting stuff feeling stuff and thinking about stuff a bodhisattva bodhisattvas should have true knowledge of their mentalities and by the way i need to pause right there There is a line. Where's the line? Do, 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 do. Well, it doesn't matter. There's a line in the beginning of the, the sutra. It is about how does the bodhisattva know the mentalities of sentient beings or know the minds of sentient beings. If you've read a lot of Mahayana sutras, you've heard the language of Buddhas knowing, knowing the minds of all sentient beings. If you were here for the Vimalakirti talk or you're familiar with the, the super knowledges or the superpowers, the Siddhis, the Abhinyas, all of the, all of the super knowledge stuff, this, one of the super knowledges is the ability to read people's minds. And so because I'm not, again, I said this last time, I'm not a, I'm not a tantrist. I'm not going to try, I'm not here to keep anything from anybody. Um, what's interesting, if you want to know about Vijuprapta's questions and the Buddha's answer, is that hidden in here, and, and I'm just going to kind of tease it out here, hidden in here is the secret hidden knowledge for how to read people's minds uh, do you want to know that bodhisattvas in training you want to know how to read people's minds right i've i've revealed the secret many times it and what it has to do with it has to do with this little secret this little dharma buddha secret which is that all minds whether it's a grasshopper or uh, you or me or a god, actually, that all minds operate based on wanting, not wanting, and being confused about things. That all minds actually operate on this same principle of the three poisons. And so all people's behavior can be understood through their wants, non-wants, and confusion about what's going on. And so it's not actually telepathy like you might think, which is like this kind of like, like, oh, I know what you're thinking. It's actually being able to understand what everybody's thinking because it's the same principle at work. And this is helpful, of course, not only for reading other people's minds, but understanding your own state of suffering. Right. So, so I, I, I say all of that because this is the, this is the hidden knowledge. Bodhisattvas should have true knowledge of the mentalities of sentient beings. <laughs> what they delight in and wish for. What they delight in and wish for. Right? What circumstances aggravate their habitual defilements. <laughs> you know what is going to get people worked up. And so you know not to go near that, right? You know what faith and understanding they have achieved. What kinds of good roots they have already planted. You know what vehicles teachings will arouse, arouse their aspiration for enlightenment. So you also know, oh yeah, yeah, this person is definitely not interested in knowing about compassion, but they're, they're definitely interested in efficiency, improving their self, uh, you know, you'll sleep better, you'll, ha you'll have a better whatever, 
you know, so this is what this is talking about, knowing the right teaching at the right time, which vehicles teachings will arouse their aspirations for enlightenment. Bodhisattvas know how long it will take for their good roots to come to maturation. And Bodhisattvas should examine all these things carefully and provide the proper remedy needed to cut off those sentient beings passions completely and cause them to develop wholesome minds continuously. Vijaprapta. You should know that the various inclinations and activities of sentient beings are difficult to discern. Nobody said this was going to be easy, Vijaprapta. They are not known to any Shravaka or Prakteya Buddha, solitary sages, much less to regular ordinary people or to the heterodox, other, other teachings. Right? For example, Vijaprapta, some living beings, even though they are attached to desires, can nevertheless be brought to maturity and can, to, and, and can achieve anuttara samyak sambodhi. Some can mature and thus attain supreme illumination and liberation as soon as they contact desired objects or even talk about them with a corrupt mind. Some can then be matured and thus attain supreme illumination and liberation through the cessation of passions and deep contemplation on impermanence, which arises from their awareness of the deterioration of the beautiful things they have seen and craved. So that's a long, convoluted kind of paragraph that if I may summarize for the sake of time, because there's a number of, 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 this goes further, that little paragraph is basically saying to the Bodhisattva Vijaprapta, yes, I know <laughs> that I told the Shravakas, I told the Theras, I told the elders, that to come into contact with the desired object and to cling to it produces suffering. And so stay away from the desired object. Yes, I know I said that. However, there are some living beings that it is by them coming into contact with the thing that they want, getting what they want, experiencing the pleasure of getting the thing that they did, but then seeing that thing deteriorate, seeing the beautiful go away, come to a realization of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And it actually will be due to the desired object that they came to that realization. There's probably um, 84,000 other ways to interpret that statement, but I'm going to go with that one for my Dharma talk tonight. That that's essentially what I hear the Buddha saying there is that, yes, I know that we've had this talk about desire and all of that, but it's more complicated than that. And there might be these situations where people come into contact with what they want, again, get, even get the pleasure from it, but then see that it goes away and have a realization. So let's not rush into anything, Vijaprapta. Okay. I'll pause there for questions, answers, ideas. And yes. We'll I have a question, Michael. Um, I know that I have the tendency to always coming from, you know, the non-dual <laughs> understanding of things and the self, I'm aware. But I'm wondering if um, in the text ever... So my question is, does he explain ever where desire 
originally come from. Right? He says there is desire for objects, feelings, thoughts, blah, blah, blah. And then we, so, but my question is, where's the desire coming from? And I'm thinking about Advaita. And I think we talked, you know, I think you talked about it in one of the previous um, talks that desire comes from um, the misunderstanding that there is a separate self, right? Yeah. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm no, thinking you don't about need me. <laughs> I, I need you. I need you definitely. Because I was thinking, you know, with babies, you know, in the first, I mean, I don't have a baby, but, you know, um, in the first couple of years, they don't have a sense of I. So they don't have this suffering so much. You know, they, they give things away and they have, they don't have it so strongly. And then eventually they, um, yeah, when, when the sense of self evolves, the whole drama, you know. Um, so <laughs> my question is, does in this text particularly, does he ever um, mention where desire um, comes from? Okay. Uh, hmm. I mean, yeah, but you, you just said it though. And he yeah. said... I mean, <laughs> this is, um, it, it, yeah, it's from the, the, <laughs> well, it's a couple of things, right? So sentient beings act out of desire because they are bound by wrong views. But you said this, mm -hmm. they make distinctions among phenomena and then cling to and indulge in those things. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, you already said it. You already know what's going on here, Connie. But the idea, of course, is that it's like, and, and this does cut to the deeper uh, bodhisattva wisdom here, which is that it's, it's, it's one thing to have the perceived object. I, you know, I'm always looking for things that I want, right? But this perceived object that I find desirable and that I want it. And then a perceived object that I find not so desirable and I don't want it. But the deeper bodhisattva wisdom is how even perceiving something as a entity other than myself is a weird form of desire, a weird form of craving in the sense of like wanting it to be that, craving for it to be that. Mm -hmm. And so the very manifestation of all phenomena is this, is this, um, you know, outpouring of the desire, the, uh, the attraction, aversion, and confusion in that way. Mm. You mentioned it, Connie, and so I'm going to do it. I wasn't going to do it, but you mentioned the baby. And so it's, it's actually funny that you should say that about the baby because in, in my pantomiming of greed, by pantomiming of attraction, aversion, and confusion, I was pantomiming a baby, actually, which for me is like, whoa, what's going on here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah. Like the, the shifts from desire to aversion, attraction, confusion, it's so rapid that they're like this little karma ball and that indeed it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse until it's like this. <laughs> but again, I'm not giving babies that free pass anytime soon. So if you want to see, if you want to see the three poisons, like in full action, babies are actually kind of a, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> a little case study in it that way, because <laughs> they don't let it, they don't uh, shy away from it. They'll let you know if they're happy, they'll let you know it. If they're not happy, they'll let you know it. Uh, okay, um, thank you. Yep. Any other questions, ideas? Michael, could I? Please. Uh, about the Bodhisattva path, uh, in particular uh, in the five path presentation, uh, you mentioned that in the Prajna Paramita Sutra, the instructions directed to uh, Avalokiteshvara while he's practicing a Prajna Paramita, they are you you refer as they they being in the path of practice or preparation my question is if that stage in which avalokiteshvara 
is or was or whatever in that text is the same as the one known by the path of meditation. So mm. accumulation, meditation, seeing the darshan amarga, and and then I don't remember. But I was asking if that path was, uh, in which Avalokiteshvara was was the path of meditation. Um, yeah, without going too deep into the minutia of this uh, scaffolding of the ten bumi stages, yeah, because the meditation is the stage of of. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's tr it's tricky, but the yeah, the uh, yeah, the the meditation. Oh, uh, it's got yeah, yeah, yeah. The the meditation is the first. I don't want to say it's the first step. Oh, you know, chronology. <clears throat> The basic idea, Eric, just to summarize quickly, the reason why I spent all of last time on this idea of the Dharma Dhatu, the, the realm of reality, is because that realm of, of equ equality, as another way of thinking of it or putting it, is a realm of equalization of all, the equalization of all phenomena. That sort of bodhisattva view the meditation that Eric mentioned, that is basically preparatory for the practice of upaya, the practice of the bodhisattva, which is what Vidyaprapta is asking about now, which is this idea of like, how do I do, like, I see that it's all equal. How do I do that? That makes, Eric, your question, like, a great question, but I'm going to bring it back to the sutra. Yeah? Cool. Okay. So, again, it's sort of like the idea of emptiness, the idea of the practice of emptiness, or in terms of the meditation on emptiness. It's going to be clear in a second. I need to do some, I'm going to do something kind of funny or something. So because of time, and I mean, I, I, I'm going to be lucky now if we get through this first uh, treasury here. So there are three, <laughs> it's funny, there's three examples that are coming up. And in, in, in my translation here in, in pencil, they are X. <laughs> so this kind of, you know, this funny thing about a uh, 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 triple X, right? Pornography, like, don't go anywhere near this, kids, right? Um, these, this is going to be the triple X tonight. And these are these three very, very, very interesting, very paragraphs. Yeah, each is a paragraph. They're dealing with sexuality. And, you know, talk about, talk about open for interpretation, talk about risky, talk, I mean, talk about, uh, talk about risque, I mean, all, all this stuff. And they actually get progressively crazier. Like the third one is tr truly the triple X. <laughs> like, um, and I don't exactly know how to deal with them here's the here's the thing too about sexuality i i i backed us all the way up by saying you know uh raga it means it's thing very very um general and broad in the sense of like attraction and you could be attracted to to all kinds of things right it, it, you could be attracted to you could want a lot of things in fact, you know, here, really quickly, I want you to think about this, um, bef you know, before I even try to do these really quickly, I want you to think about this, uh, this is going to be a, um, what are you, what are you like a, 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 like a psychological experiment, but it's, I, it's not a real, it's a, it's a psychological, psychological experiment, right? We're just going to think about it. 
So it's not really a psychological experience. So, so the first part of this is that like, so take for example, like something, I don't um, hair, I was thinking herring, I would herring. I love herring. The, the, the fishier the fish, the more fishy fish, the more I like it. You know, when I the Netherlands and they the little, you know, pickle herring sandwiches that not a lot of people are really into, right? You, you put a Bruges herring, you put a little pickled herring sandwich, it's like, I want it. I, want, I was like, mmm, right? But I know that I'm kind of not, I, you know, that's me and the Dutch. And so for a lot of other people, if you put a pickled herring sandwich, it's going to cause aversion. They're going to actually go away from the pickled herring sandwich. <laughs> and I'm going to go towards it. So right there, it's, it's like this, this, uh, like, um, kind of echo echo of the dharma datu there the echo of this relativity equality thing that even there's a way that even these two de, uh, attraction and aversion desire and 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 not wanting in that way wanting not wanting that these are kind of the same thing in a way like that that aversion is sort of a not wanting it or wanting it to not be <laughs> <laughs> right? So I just want to start subtly dropping that on you that like even ideas of attraction and aversion, if you really put them under the Dharma scope are like subtly just two sides of the same coin. Okay. But now let's go a little deeper in this psychological, psychological experiment, which is let's say it's something that you want. So take something that you really like. And don't, it doesn't have to be even a food item or whatever. It could be whatever, right? And so there is that attraction and wanting of that thing. And then take something or think of something that you're afraid of or fearful of or whatever, right? Or better way, I'll do it this way. I want you to take the thing in your mind, the psychological experiment, take the thing that you like and want and crave and desire and i want you to put it on the opposite side of a you know a plexiglass sheet of glass like you 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 know you you were the one that put it there you know you can't get you can get to the thing you want right if you're sitting on the other side of the plexiglass like That's what the Buddhists are talking about. The, the craving, the wanting, the wanting the thing you can't have, that you think about that situation. Does it make any sense to want the thing that you know you can't have? Right? That's the, that's the emotion that the Buddhists are interested in, the illogical confused deluded one that that like kind of wants things in absentia like they're not there and i know i can't have them but i want them. that's that yeah there's su there's subtle aspects to getting what you want and yeah let's let's dispense with all of that let's look at that kind of wanting when you know you can't have it or let's flip it. This is a good one too. There's a, a lion and the lion is like, see, the lion sees you and is like, ha, ah, and comes, comes at you. It would be totally reasonable for you to be like, yeah, <laughs> ah, to be averse, to run away. But now let's say you're at the zoo and there is a, a sheet of glass that thick separating you from the tiger, but the tiger comes leaping at you. The degree to which you, you, you are like, ah, that being afraid of something you have no reason to be afraid of. That's what we're talking about. C confused, 
desire, confused anger, confused all of that. Just think about that for, for tonight, you know? And, and the reason why I'm saying all of this is like, I, I really, I really want to complicate the idea of desire. I want to bring it down to the most subtle dharmic level of wanting things to be what they are. Like the craziest, most metaphysical, subtle levels of wanting. And yes, the spectrum goes all the way up to, to how good it, how good it can feel to be touched how good it can feel to be touched sensually, how good it can feel to have sexual pleasure. Yeah, all the way up there. Okay. So just because what we're about to talk about is dealing explicitly with how good being touched sensually and sexually feels, they're dealing with that. It's the whole range, okay? And for the sake of time, well, I'll read the first, I'm going to read the first one, but I'm going to paraphrase the, the next couple. So here's the first trip. Here's the first X. Here's the first risque, like what did the Buddha just say moment? So. I have one, one, one question about desire. Now's the time. Okay, cool. So what I'm thinking about desire and um, I might be wrong that, Desire itself doesn't seem like a negative thing or bad thing, right? Like desire, sexual pleasure, for example, in itself is not bad or desire for ice cream or whatever, you know, your desire. I mean, the, the suffering comes then, the suffering is not part of the desire itself. The suffering is part of when then you don't get it or, you know what I'm saying? Like I do yeah, at the very end of, yeah. I'm thank you, Connie. And, and I'm very glad then that I took that kind of uh, Dharma detour in desire because that's, that was, that's precisely right. That I wanted my example of putting the thing behind the glass and then not being able to get it is I wanted, I wanted to separate the, yeah, I wanted to separate the actual pleasure from the that might be received from it from the wanting it. Because what's interesting about wanting is you don't have it. That's the point of wanting. You don't have it. Like when you are being touched, you don't want it. You, you have it. You're like, so yeah, so good looking on like let's we're looking at the wanting in that sense and so here's our first example and by the way just i want to make this clear to the other examples that i'm going to paraphrase they explicit say oh yeah and and if you're attracted to women or you're attracted to men like just flip it so I want to make clear that this sutra is pretty advanced because they even recognize that they're kind of putting this in the male for the female, but very quickly in the in the next segment they're like, oh yeah, and by the way, this isn't just about men desiring women or women desiring men or men desiring men or women desiring men. It's like we're talking about desire. So just because the example is that. Some men do not have any passion or craving for women at first glance. But when they later recall a woman's charming appearance, they become attached to it. Some become desirous and absorbed in desire. They see a beautiful woman in their dreams. Some become enchanted with women simply on hearing voices. Yet, sometimes these same men can be brought to maturity, attain supreme illumination and liberation merely during a temporary cessation of their craving.
do I need to decode terrorization of their craving? So, by this is an example. This is the Buddha's example of what he said, which was that it is that some living beings, even though they are attached to a desire, can nevertheless be brought to maturity and attain Anatara Samyak Sambodhi merely by coming into contact with that desired object. For example, it is possible for a man <laughs> to be brought to maturity and thus attain supreme illumination and liberation merely during a temporary cessation of craving. So that is basically this really like, <gasps> in terms of like the Theravada renunciatory path, that's like a, <gasps> did the Buddha just say that you could get enlightened by ejaculating? Did the Buddha just say that that by a temporary cessation of one's desire, you could get supreme enlightenment. It kind of sounds like he said that. But again, these are wide open to interpretation. So let's keep digging, right? So after the first, like, what did the Buddha just say? Therefore, Vijaprat, because Bodhisattvas thoroughly know all diseases, all diseases derived from desire and their cures, and at the same time sees no duality in the Dharmadhatu. They engender great compassion, who are ignorant of the Vijaprapta. Since desire, anger, delusion, and the wisdom of to are all inapprehensible, the Bodhisattva thinks, as I see it, these living beings have desire, anger, and delusion regarding composites that are actually order devoid of form, empty in nature, very names. I'll examine this situation and abide naturally these beings deluded by I fulfill all my previous vows by bringing them to maturity with effortless wisdom without being perturbed by anything not becoming perturbed by any dark. Hey, hey, Michael, you're breaking. By the way, that's why I spent all night last time on. Two of them being all equally dependently originated and therefore dependently contingent upon all other things for their existence. Right, that was the idea of the Dharma Dhatu. So, you know, Connie, everybody that's into non duality were there. In fact, Vijaprapta has been there the whole time. That's the idea is that they're in the, this is this bright eyed Bodhisattva in the Dharma Dhatu that's like in this realm of e equality. And, you, you know, on this notion of sexuality and stuff. This is this is this is for real. This is the actual dharma here, which is that for the Theravadins, for the Shravakas, for the old school Buddhists, to say non-ejaculation is purity, non-sex is purity. And to ejaculate, to have sensual contact, to have sexual contact that, that is impure that is bad the bodhisattva is like bad good pure impure what are you talking about dude what are you talking about that's what deluded worldlings do is go around judging things as good and worthy of wanting and bad and having to avoid that's the realm of duality that's the realm of judgment that's the realm of all the problems 
So the Bodhisattva is deep in the realm of equality, looks around, right? And says, as I see it, all living beings have desire, anger, and delusion regarding compounded things, right? Which are actually devoid of form. Empty. Empty in nature. Shunyata in nature. And which exist only as arbitrary names. Arbitrary names. Sexuality. Ejaculation. They're arbitrary names. Right? And then somebody might be like, oh my God, he said ejaculation, right? Arbitrary names and words and ideas, right? So then, because I would like to get through this, any questions, ideas about that idea? The, the next one, which is the double X. So this is the, so the first one, was basically saying like, it's possible to get enlightened by having sex. And this basically opens the gateway to the Vajrayana, by the way. Like a, a little line like that, that basically has the Buddha saying like, yeah, it's possible. Like, yeah, yeah, it's totally possible. Opens the gateway to the Vajrayana, tantric Buddhism, tantric sex, all of that. And then in the next example, the double X, I mean, I'm not going to read it. And if you have it at home, read it. It's basically about, man, it's basically about somebody becoming infatuated with, sexually infatuated with somebody. And then the Bodhisattva, somebody like Vijaprapta, the Bodhisattva turning themselves into whether it's a male or a female whatever they need whatever the person wants they're going to turn themselves into that and then basically ravish them lavish them with passionate love and then when they have indulged their passions to the utmost the bodhisattva will using means of commensurate using means commensurate with the man's capacity, pluck out the poisonous arrow of desire in him, and then by miraculous power, change back into their form, da 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 da. So this is getting a little wild because this is talking about the Bodhisattva's upayak practice some uh, somebody like Vijaprapta, that it may be again this is an interpretive reading that it may be their skillful mean or their upaya to appear as an object of sexual desire for somebody give them all the sexual gratification that they want and then when they're sitting there on the pillow just like totally blissed out drop the dharma on them ba 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 and the idea is, is that if that's what it took, if that's what it took, then success. No harm, no foul, all of that. Vijaprapta. Those sentient beings are afflicted by 21,000 actions of desire. And other, wrong, and other wrong actions, totaling 84,000 in all. <laughs> a bodhisattva with effortless wisdom can open up myriads of dharma doors to lead them to liberation without conceiving a notion that he has expounded certain doctrines for living beings or that any being has been liberated. Vijaprapta. For example, the, the Buddha and his examples, right? For example, the, the Naga king, 
the Naga king of the lake called Anavatapta. No heat. Uh, I don't think it says it, so I'm going to tell you real quick. Yeah. So this is a cool story about a Naga, a serpent king, a Naga king, who is the king of this giant lake called Anavatapta, which means no heat. This very cool lake, but it's actually a lake that's at sort of the middle of the earth. It's a, it's a very, very special source of water of which the four rivers of the Ganges, the Indus River, the Oxus or something, all these four rivers in India all supposedly originate from Anavatapta. And so Vijaprapta, for example, the Naga king of the lake called No Heat, by the power of his karma, issues forth great the four great rivers from his palace to cool down the summer heat for sentient beings who live on land or in water, to nourish flowers, fruit trees, and grains, and to give living beings peace and happiness. However, the Naga king does not conceive the notion that he issues, has issued, or will issue forth these rivers. He spontaneously keeps the four rivers full for sentient beings' use. Similarly, Bodhisattvas fulfill their past vows by expounding the four noble truths with effortless wisdom in order to eliminate all the burning distresses of samsara and to give the holy bliss of liberation to all gods and humans. However, those bodhisattvas do not conceive the notion that they are teaching, have taught, or will teach the Dharma. <laughs> they spontaneously abide in great compassion, observe sentient beings, and explain the Dharma according to their needs. Questions, answers, comments? So this is a really important one that I'm, I'm glad that I was able to get to in time this uh it, this is a cosmological aspect of I indian cosmology which is this this uh, lake in the middle of the world but of course in a buddha in a buddhist text we all you know it's a cipher we gotta we gotta we gotta get out our shovels and start digging into this right so it's this beautiful metaphor i i think like why Anavatapta? Why this? Why this uh, lake? It's hidden. It's this hidden, deep down, that is this source of cooling, refreshing, peace-giving energy, right, for the world. And the Bodhisattva is like that too. And I guess what I'm kind of starting to hint at with this is that, like. You know, if the Bodhisattva is in the business of maturing sentient beings, but also bringing peace and gladness and coolingness, it's like this is also about, in, in terms of the first um, treasury here, it's about cooling out that desire, techniques for cooling out that desire in a way. And I know that they're talking about some risque stuff with this sexuality, but ultimately, they are talking about trying to sort of cool that desire. All right. Triple X. This is going to be the, the third one. So if the first one was just this idea that somebody could get like enlightened by a sexual situation... And the second one was kind of this wild idea of the Bodhisattva actually kind of like engaging in sexuality as some kind of teaching device or something. Although 
when we're talking about transformations from male to female, like uh, it's getting wild. And so now when we find out as a further example, Vidyaprapta, Indra, we talked about Indra last time. Indra can remain unaffected while transforming himself into bodies numerous enough to satisfy separately and simultaneously the sensual desires of his 12 myriad celestial maidens, causing each of them to think that she alone is sporting with Indra. Likewise, the Bodhisattva can remain unaffected while bringing to maturity those beings who are capable of being delivered in accordance with their wishes. <laughs> so basically, it's like the first one is just, uh, you know, a sexual encounter getting aligned because of some fleeting phenomena and all that. The second one is a bodhisattva by transformation, like kind of like a bodhisattva consort right like transforming himself pleasing somebody da, da, da. this third one i don't even know what's going on this is like uh multiple bodies at once pleasing multiple people this is definitely above my pay grade uh you know Bodhi bodhisattva speaking and and indeed i do think these are ooching their way up to a sort of inconceivable liberated state where this bodhisattva that can somehow be multiple places at once simultaneously. Yeah. We're not talking about an embodied being in that sense. In, in fact, Vijaprapta to illustrate further and maybe to shed a little, shed a little light on that. The sun emerging from behind a mountain sheds its light all over the world and causes the various colors such as blue, yellow, red, and white to appear wherever it shines. While the sunlight itself remains one undifferentiated single colored light. Similarly, the Bodhisattva, the son of wisdom, illuminates the entire Dharma Dhatu in the same manner by rising above the mountainous attachments of sentient beings and teaching them the Dharma according to their needs, while they themselves see no duality in the Dharma Dhatu. So, uh, again, I spent all of last time equating or e e um, uh, acquainting, acquainting us with this idea of the Dharma Dhatu, because indeed, you know, Vijaprapta is already there. He's already in the Dharma Dhatu. That's where his realm is. And so the Buddha is sort of speaking to him in light of that. And so this beautiful analogy, which is that, and this is like, you know, this is, um, this is, this, this is one to think about <laughs> this light, the sunlight, which like a prism can show us is this kind of rainbow. Right. And it's like, Oh, look, green, white, blue, like all of these colors while the sunlight itself is this one color. The one monolithic kind of uh, the sunlight itself remains one undifferentiated single colored light. That's the idea of the Dharma Dhatu, that all things are ultimately this sort of one undifferentiated single colored light. And yeah, I get white, blue, red, orange, but it's not that red blue is better than black and this and that it's like to judge the light phenomena 
And to judge one bandwidth of it is better than the other or more desirable than the other. It's like, dude, hello, uh, dude, rise above your mountainous attachments, dude. <clears throat> right. So, so that's the idea. And the, the refrain, the refrain of the sutra is, of course, the Bodhisattva does all of this while remaining non-dual in the Dharmadhatu, does, sees, sees no distinctions. In fact, sees no distinctions in terms of having taught anything to anybody, ha will teach anything to anybody, you know? That's just, that's not the way this is happening. So Vijaprapta, this, this is what is meant by a bodhisattva mahasattva's hidden treasury of the practice of desire. Once bodhisattvas have acquired this store, they can, for a kalpa or more, transform themselves into myriad bodies in accordance with sentient beings' wishes and desires and teach them the Dharma in various modes of expression without seeing any duality in the Dharma Dhatu. Furthermore, Vijaprapta just has one final, one final example. Real gold remains the same in nature when an artisan turns it into various necklaces and other ornaments. In like manner, bodhisattvas observe the Dharma Dhatu well. They transform themselves into myriad bodies in accordance with sentient beings' wishes and explain the Dharma to them in many different modes of expression. But they see no duality in the Dharma Dhatu, this is called constant penetration of the oneness of the Dharma Dhatu. Having acquired this store of wisdom, having acquired this hidden treasury, bodhisattvas can give various discourses on the Dharma to living beings who, after hearing them, will be enriched with inexhaustible holy treasures and be freed from the poverty of samsara forever. So we did it. That's the end of the first treasury. I hope everybody saw the full circle there on this idea of poverty. The Bodhisattva is not Mr. Moneybags. Being a Bodhisattva does not mean that you're going to get the good branding deal and have all the, all the big, no. When the, when the sutra said that if, if you, the Bodhisattva that acquires these five hidden treasuries will be relieved from poverty forever, they were talking about the poverty of samsara, right? That, these, that's the jewels that we're talking about. The jewels that will like, you know, buy, that we buy, buy our way out of samsara, right? <laughs> okay, that's it for me. Questions, answers, comments, ideas? Awesome. Oh, yeah, awesome. I hope everybody, you know, so this is talking about a bodhisattva, as an example, practicing sexuality, practicing sexuality like flip mode, like tr uh, uh, transformation mode, and then practicing sexuality, multiple partners. I don't know. But the point is, though, is that the little quick, lesson i did the chinese is about these are the bodhisattvas practice of desire 
the the practice so this is again opening the way to a tantric vajrayana practice which is about using sexuality using sexual energy using these various things rather than avoiding them so there will be a more of that to come now wait a minute okay well maybe <laughs> i'm reading the comments here folks um i think what the, the the message tonight is never say never the message tonight is this idea that that like that that's possible and as bad you 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 failed bodhisattva you know what i mean so no, I get it. I, I mean, so in Theravada, basically anything, anything having anything to do with sex was kind of bad, right? It's like, Facto. Get, it's like, yep. And this is a little more, this is, yeah, this is a different path. So. Thank you. All right, folks. Until next week, we will open up the hidden treasury of anger. Uh, next time. So. Thank you, Michael. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. I think that we can all. Amazing. Thank I think, you. I think we can all get behind the message that babies have really been let off the hook for far too long, and <laughs> we should cease giving them the enlightenment pass that we've been giving them. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Um, I put some links in the chat if anyone would like to donate. The, um, the entire Dharma Collective runs on donations. Uh, the people who do the scheduling donate their time. Um, everything that we pass on to the teachers, which is a, a big chunk of the donations now that we're not paying rent, um, all comes from the community. We don't have uh, you know any kind of sponsorship or funding or anything. We're entirely created by the community. So if you can uh, uh, toss something into the pot, please do. And if you can't, keep coming back. Um, and either way, I want to tell you all about two things coming up this week. One is we're starting on Tuesday. It's going to be, we think, 12 weeks, but we might um, tack more teachers onto the end if they sort of appear. Uh, we're starting an engaged Dharma series um, all around the idea of wise action and how we as meditators in particular can meet the kind of meta crisis that's happening in the world right now. Um, there can be a tendency to want to go in and, um, and sort of disconnect from the world, but like we've been talking about all night, that's not necessarily um, the way to do it. So we pulled in a whole bunch of different teachers from the collective, including MC Owens, um, coming up in August. And each Tuesday, a different teacher will answer that question of like, how do we as meditators meet this moment? Um, so you can register for that. You actually, you have to register for it in advance. Um, so there's a link to that in the chat. And we're also running a six month series, one Saturday a month with George Haas on Dharma maps. So if you're a map geek or an aspiring map geek or recovering map geek or um, you're blissfully unaware of map geekery at all, but interested, um, that's coming up this Saturday and you can register for that. Uh, you can see details on our website. And even if you can't make all six, if you register, you get the recordings and you get a link to a Dropbox with like all sorts of reading and stuff. So um, check that out if you're curious about it. It's a really interesting series. And I think, yeah, that's all for announcements. Unless, Noam, you've got something? So you're unmuted. No. Nope. Okay. I was just going to say thank you to MC Owens. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thanks. Happy birthday, Katie. Oh, thank you. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Thanks. Hey. Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Aw, <laughs> <Aww>. yay. Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs>